take our, I'm just gonna need a little bit of cooperation so I can see. <laughs> I love you all, but I uh, wanna see too. Um, I do wanna welcome Special Agent Colleen M. Rowley of the FBI. She's been an FBI agent for 21 years. She's currently the Chief Division Counsel for the Minneapolis Field Office of the FBI. She came um, to the attention of this committee when she wrote a letter to Director Mueller that was given to members of Congress. And her letter refers to a number of issues this committee has heard from other FBI agents in the past. Um, and uh, Senator Hatch and I felt that by the nature of the hearing we're having today, it would be good if she uh, if she testified. And um, the did you want to say something, Warren, no, before that's it starts? Fine. I'm just looking. For, I'm just looking forward to your testimony. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I yes. say something? The uh, uh, Senator Milo, of course. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, because uh, Special Agent uh, Rowley uh, is a native of my home state of Iowa and she's also a native of my wife's hometown of New Hampton, Iowa. But more importantly, uh, Agent Rowley is a patriotic American who had the courage to put truth first and raise critical but important questions about how the FBI handled a terrorist case before the attacks and about the FBI's cultural problems. Agent Rowley, uh, your testimony today is a great service to this committee, the entire Congress, the FBI and the American people, and I thank you for coming. We should be honored to hear your testimony today. Uh, people like you who come forth to, uh, as, uh, as I put it, to commit the truth of a very terrible sin among some federal employees, uh, but you, you come forth with important information uh, a, 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 a about the FBI there's been heroes like Fred Whitehurst before you who exposed the FBI crime lab scandal. We had four agents last summer who revealed disparities in discipline and a pattern of retaliation against those who investigated misconduct inside the FBI. Agent Rowley has thrown the spotlight on specific and general problems happening at the FBI before the terrorist attacks and she has important insights with her perspective from the field about what the FBI can do to change. The FBI must improve so it can prevent future terrorist attacks, and her testimony, I believe, is very important to help this happen. Ms. Rowley, I believe, is a dedicated public servant who tells it like it is. She wanted to be an FBI agent since she was five years old, and she had a distinguished, has had a distinguished 20-year career at the FBI. She worked uh, in a variety of, uh, uh, of offices, including New York, where she investigated mafia after learning Italian and worked with people like Rudy Giuliani, Louis Free, and Michael Chertoff. Uh, she worked in the Minneapolis Division now since 1990 in a number of areas, including as the ethics offer, officer. Agent Rowley, I thank you again for agreeing to testify today so that we can hear your constructive criticism of the FBI to help it reform and to help it improve. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, well, Ms. Rowley, both Senator Wellstone is a senior senator from your state, and um, uh, Senator Grassley, who is from your uh, state of birth, have said very good things about you, and they both have uh, gone out of their way to talk to members of the committee. With all that, now we'd like to hear from you. And I should mention there a roll call vote has started. Why don't you begin your uh, statement? If we have to stop at some point, I will. It won't be because of something you said. It's only because we have to vote in person. Go ahead. Well, the first thing I want to do is um, thank you for the opportunity to appear today. I never really anticipated this kind of impact um, when I wrote this letter to Director Miller to over two weeks ago. Um, I don't know if you know, I think they've been saying I anguished over this a week. It wasn't even quite a week that I, um, it was more like a three-day period and it was a fairly sleepless three-day period when I began to initially just jot down my thoughts because I knew I had to appear before the staffers of the Joint Intelligence Committee and I didn't want to forget anything. 
And also, you'll probably find out I'm a little better on paper than I am verbally, so I was kind of afraid of that. Um, that was one of the reasons I started to write it down. I also had another big impetus that, um, that was kind of behind this all. And one of the things uh, was that I saw the new direction of the FBI, perhaps. It was kind of hard to discern when it was first announced. But I thought I saw some impetus towards a little more um, additional bureaucracy and um, micromanaging from headquarters. And I wanted to point out to uh, Director Mueller that that seemed to fly in the face of, of what we should have learned from September 11th. And the two things were, were the impetus for the letter. Uh, I, of course, you know I have many years of experience in the FBI. I really do care um, really about the FBI. I've invested, you know, almost half my life in it. And I do care also about our protection now. I've got four children. Uh, all my, a lot of my friends have children. And um, I really think we ought to be doing our best to try to prevent any future acts of terrorism. Um, I, uh, I did, in the last couple of weeks, receive um, hundreds. Um, I was counting them for a while, but I lost track. I, but I received hundreds of emails and telephone calls from agents uh, mostly agents, some supervisors, some prosecutors, um, some retired FBI leaders. And um, I'm not going to presume to speak for all of those people, but when I looked at them, and I've read most of them, there's a few I probably haven't gotten a chance to look at that have come in since I left, but of the ones I, I looked at, I did see a real common theme emerging. Um, it seems like they are kind of struck a chord with a lot of people about this idea about the bureaucracy. A lot of other agents t told me s similar stories and about cases that had, uh, you know, maybe unjustifiably not gotten anywhere. And I have a, you know, I have a whole stack of those. Uh, I think there is really the main thing being a real strong consensus that we need to streamline the FBI's bureaucracy in order to more effectively combat terrorism. Uh, we need that agility that uh, Director Mueller was speaking of this morning, that agility and ability to quickly react. And I really see that as um, if you get too top-heavy with too many layers, he, he also mentioned that problem, that you are going to be stymied. Uh, I was encouraged by Director Mueller's testimony this morning because I think many of his ideas uh, do seem to go in the right direction and actually are quite consistent with the um, various items I had in my letter to him. <coughs> he, he really has an extremely difficult job, and that's an understatement. Uh, when I talk about trying to trim the bureaucracy a little bit, I don't know how you can underestimate that. It's been tried before and failed, and he just has a tremendously difficult job, which uh, I can appreciate. Uh, I want everyone to know that no one today previewed in the FBI. I, of course, they gave me approval to be here, but no one uh, was. No one read the statement I did. I did this one quite, quite quickly because I didn't know I was coming until recently. And in this statement, which I'm not going to read um, because you can read it when you want to, I. I have some ideas in here. Some of these ideas, again, come from other agents, some of whom are more experienced in intelligence than I am. Uh, and then some of them are my own ideas. Um, I am the legal counsel, so some of the legal issues are things that I've seen as an issue that have arisen in the past few years. And uh, you can read that at your leisure, and if someone wants to ask me a specific question about any of those, uh, that's fine. Uh, there, uh, part of I guess what I can maybe go on be beyond what Director Mueller, um, I guess what I'm going to try to do is the FBI made mistakes prior to September 11th. Uh, I made a little mistake. If you look at my letter, I made a mistake on the first page. I, mean, I, I got the date wrong. It was August 16th. I mean, it, I, I proofread it once and I missed it. Um, we all make mistakes, and I think that um, there are other levels of our criminal justice system. There are other federal agencies I'm not going to talk about, but there are also the, the prosecutors when you try to go criminal. There's uh, entities in the Department of Justice, and so to s some extent I've kind of broadened some of uh, what I have written in my statement to include those other criminal justice entities that, you know, the FBI is, is real important, but we certainly, uh, there's certainly other uh, entities that are very important here, too. Uh, <clears throat> I was also encouraged, I didn't, uh, I don't know if anyone asked a question about it today, but when I read Director Mueller's statement, he 
points to integrity. I think it's the last page also, and he does point to that as an issue. Um, and I, I'm very um, encouraged by that because, um, of course, if you look at the end of my statement, I think integrity is extremely important. Uh, some of the people this morning did ask questions about how are we going to effectively combat terrorism. Uh, we're going to be in a proactive environment, which definitely has the potential of, of uh, maybe interfering with people's civil liberties. Uh, and how are we going to still protect those civil liberties? And I honestly think integrity really plays into this uh, whole item. Uh, a lot of, of when you're asking for some new law or some new authority, it's perhaps not only what the law allows you to do, but it's how it's going to be done. And then it really boils down to an issue of trust with the agency or the entity that you're giving this particular power to. And there are, this, there, there are potentials for abuse if you go over that line. And I think uh, as an agency, we have to be so, uh, so completely truthful and honest that people are able to uh, trust the FBI that we will not cross those lines and uh, commit, or commit uh, any kind of civil rights violation or collect too much information, et cetera. Um, that basically is uh, all I want to say, and then if anyone has a question from my statement. Ms. Raleigh, we will. What I'm going to do now, we have about four minutes left in this vote. I'm going to suggest everybody go and vote. We'll stand in recess for a minute for the amount of time it takes. Come back, and that way we'll be uninterrupted. Thank you. everybody could get must be hot weather nobody wants to go outside um, agent Raleigh you may uh, be interested in knowing and I haven't even had a chance to um, share this with Senator Grassley a copy of this has gone to Senator Hatch um, Dan Bryant of the Department of Justice has sent me a letter following a request I made assuring both me and Senator Hatch there will not be any retaliation uh, against you in any form for the letter you sent to the FBI director. Um, of course, that would also extend to the testimony here. I will put this letter to Senator Hatch and myself in the in the record and um, uh, Senator Grassley and I have both notified the Attorney General and the Director that we would be following this matter carefully. Anyway, let me ask this um, question of you and I asked this question basically to Director Mueller this morning, so I want to ask you as well. To your knowledge, did the agents in Minneapolis, or in headquarters for that matter, ever try to do a routine search uh, for reports on aviation schools or pilot training on the automated case system? I'm not talking about putting in somebody's name, but for search words like aviation schools or, or pilot um, uh, training. Um, anybody do that? Um, well, I know a little bit about our, um, our uh, ACS system and the records we have and as well as the search methods we have because I also do our freedom of information requests. 
And of course, there are strict uh, rules in place about how we search and when we people write to us, you know, if we find their name. Uh, our main system of records, our central record system, is indexed according to the name of the subject usually. So for instance, in a case where a per particular suspect was named, the normal method of searching would be to search that name only. Um, we also have, we do have the ability um, to search some text for a word. But unlike, for instance, if you were doing LexisNexis research, you can put in the quali and or, and there's all different ways that you can search. <clears throat> Our FBI uh, search is probably the most fundamental, rudimentary thing. You can just put in a word. So for instance, if you put in airline to do a text re retrieval, you would get up such a volume of records that it would be impossible to review. Uh, it's almost impossible to do just a one word text. Now, you can put in aviation schools? Well, you, what you can't do, for, for instance, in LexisNexis, when you're searching for things, you can put those qualifiers in that narrow it down. Right. And we can't, we have no way of doing that. We can oh. put a word in. You could put in aviation. I think we could. But and you then, couldn't put in aviation schools. No. So you might you get... You be getting aviation and you would just be getting you know, records that you couldn't possibly review. Now, what uh, the normal but, method is, is we do search those names. And that, that's because the subject's names are indexed. So for freedom of information, that's what I do. And you do, I think he mentioned that you have to have the correct spelling. That's, that's right. I mean, if you're one letter off, you may not turn up a record. But this doesn't do you much good if you're looking for somebody, for example, use nitroglycerin in types of bombings and is going around with an alias, which changes bombing to bombing. What about um, the director said in his testimony that your your office couldn't have brought up the Phoenix electronic communication on the computers and use it in, in connection with the Masawi case, but the headquarters could have done that. Is that your understanding? Uh, I don't know specifically about that EC, but I do know that prior to September 11th, a number of classified documents, and I probably almost all classified documents, were blocked so that only certain people uh, on a need-to-know basis would be, would be able to, if you went into the computer, for instance, and you didn't have that access, you aren't gonna get, have, you're not going to be able to see those things. It was also in public corruption cases, uh, other types of cases that we had this blocking. Um, and it served a good purpose in a way because, you know, it really keeps the uh, people but, maybe from abusing it. But if you have, I mean, suppose you have a cleared person. Uh, the head of your office, head of the Phoenix office, and others, they want to do a computer search on the FBI AS ACS uh, computer network. It's still difficult for them to do. Is that correct? Uh, you know, is that clear? That's, that's true. I don't know exactly how this blocking, you know, what people in, in each office were unblocked and which weren't. Typically, it was the people who had a need to work on that case only. Unfortunately, um, some of the people who may know something about it are not going to be able to go much further. Uh, you wrote that a supervisor at FBI headquarters made changes to the Minneapolis agent's affidavit. I'm talking about the FISA process now. Uh, you wrote that they made changes to the agent's affidavit that, quote, to use your words, set it up for failure. Now, the New York Times has also reported that another headquarters agent was basically banned from the courts, from the FISA courts, uh, by the judge based on his past affidavits. I know that um, in response to some of these problems, the FBI has instituted the so-called Woods procedures, and we put that in the record. It's been declassified. We put it in the record this morning. Do you think uh, that some of these problems with the FISA court made headquarters more cautious and risk-averse in processing the FISA applications to the court? I've never actually served at headquarters, so um, I'm... I guess I would only be speaking from hearsay uh, and as well as maybe the opinions of some of the people that have uh, called me and, and emailed me. I think that uh, when incidents occur where people in the FBI are disciplined uh, or even, even investigated possibly, I think there are some consequences to that and it does in the future make them much more careful. In the instances that I'm aware of in our office where that's happened, uh, we have typically in order not to repeat the problem, we've instituted some kind of procedure that makes it more difficult. 
so I think that in a way, um, you know, from what I know of it, and again, I've never served in headquarters, that I would probably agree. You also wrote that uh, you and the agents in Minneapolis were frustrated with a headquarters agent that was assigned to the Masawi case, and it actually hindered your investigation. Did you or any other supervisor or agent in uh, Minneapolis call the agent you were concerned with, call his supervisor or others in Washington to complain about this before September 11th? I'm, uh, of course, uh, a little bit restricted in what I can talk today about the events of pre-September 11th. I had put that in my statement. I failed to mention it earlier. When I comment, I'm going to try to comment in a general way and just avoid the specifics prior to uh, the events prior and not get into true, real facts. When I wrote the letter to Director Mueller, um, I think some of the news accounts may be um, misunderstood. I really was speaking more from a third-party perspective and talking about what I saw our agents and other people in our office as opposed to me personally. Uh, I, there was a word in the first page I said I had a peripheral role and I think that's very accurate. I did have a role but it was, it was peripheral and uh, when you ask if other people uh, took these actions, you know, I, I will say this. Um, this, we have a culture in the FBI that there's a certain pecking order and it's pretty strong and it's very rare that someone picks up the phone <coughs> and calls a rank or two above themselves. It would have to be only on the, the strongest reasons. Uh, typically you, you have to pick up and call the, you know, pick up the phone and talk to somebody who is at your rank. Um, so when these, when you have an item that requires review by a higher level, it's incumbent for you to go to a higher level person in your office and then for that person to make a call. Do you, uh, has the Inspector General talked to you about this case? Uh, I've had a call from the Inspector General, but so far we haven't gotten into any uh, real facts or anything. And when did he, when did he first contact you? I, I was contacted by an investigative counsel um, from the Office of Inspector General, and that's all. <coughs> And it was basically just to um, introduce introduce herself. And how long ago? It was uh, last week, I think, uh, just a day or two after um, Director Mueller announced that it would be turned over to the Office of Inspector General. Thank you. Um, and you raised an important issue also about the so-called McDade Law in your testimony. As you know, that law was slipped into a massive omnibus appropriations bill, or some of us call it ominous appropriations bills, back in 1999. Senator Hatch and I and uh, Senator Wyden have been trying to fix this problem. In fact, we introduced, what was it, S 1437 to fix the problem. I want you to know there are some of us on the committee that recognize it is a problem, and uh, Senator Hatch and I are trying very much to fix the problem. We'll keep trying. Eventually, I hope we're going to be successful. We came very close. We thought we had it fixed in the um, USA Patriot Act, but others didn't want it to go forward been able to. But I'm committed, and I don't think I can speak for Senator Hatch. He's committed to get it fixed. Senator Hatch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome you to the committee, Ms. Raleigh. And uh, at the outset, I wanted to thank you for appearing before the committee. Uh, I also commend you for your letter of May 21st to Director Mueller. Uh, that letter raises a, a variety of significant issues that uh, need to be considered during the reorg any reorganizing of the FBI. And I can only imagine how difficult it was for you to write the letter and then forward it to Director Mueller and others. So I want to ask you a few questions to clarify some statements in the letter and to seek your views on, on uh, aspects of the specific reorganization plan. Uh, I believe the FBI is the most important uh, law enforcement agency in the world. And I know you do too, and that's why you wrote the letter. And you'd like to have it continue to uh, be a great agency. But in your letter, you detail the difficulties you and the Minneapolis agents encountered in seeking a search warrant under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act procedures. We've been referring to that as FISA all day. Uh, with the FISA and your legal training, what modifications do you believe may be warranted to the FISA statute in order to enable the FBI to obtain such approvals when uh, investigating terrorists? Um, 
Well, I heard some of the discussion this morning about the uh, the necessity to perhaps take out the uh, working on behalf of a foreign power um, aspect. Um, in thinking about that, and to be honest, I haven't thought about it a whole lot. And in addition, I have not had that much personal experience uh, in working with the FISA process. Our office is not as involved as other offices would be. Um, however, I think in a way, um, just knowing what I know about criminal and totality of circumstances, et cetera, I am not quite sure that it needs to be modified. I think in a way, perhaps what we have is because probable cause and proving or show, making these showings that are required are not like a DNA test. They're not a litmus test. You can't put it in and have it come out a hundred times the same way. And what can happen is mindsets and over time different interpretations. And you can have something becoming uh, unduly difficult when, when you actually look back maybe 10 years ago, this wasn't the case. And there was basically a, a lesser standard. I think when you look at um, totality of the circumstances and probable cause, uh, you are looking at more probable than not. I'm not even quite sure if the FISA, I think FISA statute requires it as well, more probable than not. And I think that if you look at a totality, if someone is working on behalf of a foreign power, these um, terrorist entities are not like countries. They don't have embassies. They don't send us their membership list. They don't send us uh, their little organizational charts. Um, I worked mafia cases in the 1980, and the mafia didn't do that either. <laughs> we did not, they didn't send us their membership. We had to figure it out. And after a few years, we certainly did have hierarchies of each organized crime family. But that, that was gained from surveillance. It was gained from little snippets of information we would get from wiretaps uh, that so-and-so was working for so-and-so. And I think that we should be able to use that same type of thing uh, for demonstrating that someone is working on behalf of a foreign power, especially with a terrorist organization. And I'm not sure that the language needs to be modified, but I think we need to realize that it's this, almost the same type of thing that we're up against. We are not going to get concrete uh, membership lists, organizational charts that we can say, okay, or even the, the definition of the group sometimes. These groups are very amorphous and uh, by nature terrorism groups operate more effectively without having real defined hierarchies and, and who reports to who, etc. So that's kind of my take on it. Of course, to a large degree we're talking about surveillance and, uh, and unless you can show that they are operatives for a foreign power or that they, you have probable cause to believe that they are part of Al-Qaeda, say in this particular case, you can't get a FISA uh, right to, uh, to surveil. And see, that's what I think is, uh, uh, m and many people are concerned on the other side, that, that if we grant that broad right, then it'll be misused sooner or later by somebody who would not be as perspicacious as you are or, or uh, Director Mueller is. But I see it as a big problem because, as you can see, we basically couldn't get surveillance on, I think, uh, basically all of those uh, yeah. 20. I'm not going to comment on all the facts but um, uh, of the case. I, I, my, my analysis of uh, the case is that um, perhaps that, you know, it, it already exists. You've read my letter. Right. And uh, I think that it's an, it's, a, it's an obstacle, and I think maybe it's a possibility to consider whether maybe that, that amount or that threshold should be somewhat eased, especially in well, cases with terrorists where it's, it's hard to... But I think that the things like surveillance and knowing who met who and things like that should figure into it. All right. Agent Raleigh, since your letter of May 21st, the Attorney General has issued a, n a new investigative guidelines that will expand the FBI's <laughs> investigative tools. Now, given your experience in the field, can you describe in practical terms how will these new guidelines assist the FBI, uh, at least the, the field agents, in carrying out uh, the FBI mission or missions? I have not had a chance to really fully read the modifications. I have heard um, what the three, you know, the main th topics that have been brought up about going into public meetings and surfing the net. Um, and uh, there is one additional thing, I think, in those AG guidelines, which delegates down to the SACs the ability and the authority to open up a case, a, a, a preliminary in inquiry. Um, to the extent that I am 
definitely, and I think we, the, the rest of the agents I've heard from, are definitely in favor that when it's possible to delegate down to a lower authority a level, we will be more nimble and, and agile. I am very much in favor of that ability to open up a, a preliminary inquiry by the SEC. That aspect's good. Um, I, I do want to maybe at some point get the chance to talk about um, how I know people this morning were talking about uh, their fear that some of these new um, abilities to monitor public meetings. Um, I have a little unique insight because I process freedom of information cases. And I, can, I read some of our old files from the 1950s. And I will see in there where we got the people back then, for a lot of reasons, got a little carried away. When they went to a meeting, they recorded everyone who came, whether they were important or not, whether the person advocated uh, uh, whatever, you know, uh, a uh, terrorist point of view or whatever. And I see that type of thing that happened in the past. What I think that we need to do is a lot of it is in the how. And if you go to a public meeting, for instance, maybe someone, maybe we've gotten a little bit of information that someone in that meeting might be discussing a terrorist act. I think it is very good and logical that someone would go and sit in just to make sure that it doesn't happen. So if, in fact, a person stands up and says, uh, hey, let's all do this, let's all, you know, undertake this and gives a speech about undertaking an act of terrorism, we are now going to be in a position that we will know it. Now, if that same agent, even based on a, a good tip, goes to the meeting and people are merely engaging in their First Amendment rights, here's the, the thing. Nothing happens from that information. That's the difference in the 50s. We don't come back and record who was there. We do not uh, look into the people that were there. It just ends. I think there is a difference between how we do this and exactly what the authority is. And I think to the extent that it gives us a little bit extra opportunity to per perhaps detect something, I think it would be good. In your May 21st mm -hmm. letter, you, uh, you indicate your concerns about Director Mueller's proposal to create, quote, flying squads, unquote, uh, which would operate at, uh, out of the FBI headquarters here. Uh, could you tell us more specifically uh, your concerns about such squads? Um, when I wrote the letter to Director Mueller, the term, and I, maybe it was the media that used this term, but the term that was being used was super squad. And that connotates in my mind that we're going to have more people at headquarters who now, when, a, when let's say an office does detect some terrorism or, or an actual terrorist event occurs, that now we'll get a whole contingent of managers from headquarters who will direct the case. And when that term was first used, I, again, by hearsay, I think that's what a, a lot of people in the FBI had that connotation. And I, that's what, it was a major impetus for my uh, want, giving that letter to Director okay, Mueller. I understand. Now, you, uh, just one last question because my time's about up. In your testimony, you've identified a number of significant problems with the FBI's bureaucracy. You've stated that, quote, the problem is huge, unquote, uh, that the, uh, uh, and quote, cannot be quickly cured, unquote. Now, in your view, what immediate <coughs> steps could be taken to remedy some of the problems that you've identified in your letter, and which problems will take more time to address? You know, uh, that is the $100 million question on how to reduce bureaucracy, and I really can't pretend, uh, give me another week. <laughs> Uh, I really can't pretend to, to understand. I, I know Director Mueller uh, is also very cognizant of this problem. He reiterated today that there are eight levels before you get to him. Uh, this is an unwieldy situation. If there is a way to somehow reduce the levels, I think that's where the way we need to go. Eight le seven to nine levels is, is really ridiculous, and it's just how do we do this once it gets started. Well, I'm grateful for your testimony, grateful for your letter, and, and I think you, you've done a service, and, and uh, let's hope that, uh, well, and I think Director Mueller's, Mueller has taken it very carefully and very seriously. I agree. We're, we're going to take a three-minute break. I'm wondering if the senators could all meet with me out back. That also give the uh, photographers a chance to clear, and we'll be right back.
Okay, thank you. I think, um, thank you, Ms. Raleigh. You, um, you've been very patient. I want to turn to, um, I want to turn to Senator Feinstein, who is actually doing double duty on this, um, on this investigation, like several members on both sides of the aisle, uh, traditionally, just so you know, the Judiciary Committee has always had uh, some members from both sides on the Senate Intelligence Committee, as does the Armed Services Committee and the Appropriations Committee, for the obvious reasons, because those are the Armed Services and Foreign, foreign Relations, the other one, Foreign Relations, Armed Services, Appropriation, and Judiciary. Uh, we handle classified material all the time, so we have somebody, we have members on the Intelligence Committee. Fortunately, we're meeting, in their meeting, Senator Feinstein has somehow managed to be in both places at once, and so I yield to her. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Rowley, welcome. Uh, delighted to have you here, and we thank you for your letter and for your comments uh, about your career in the FBI and your concern about it. Uh, you indicated earlier that you were watching uh, this morning in the testimony of Director Mueller. Oh, I asked my questions really based on some of the things you said in the letter to the director, and one of them involved the FISA process. Um, and without going into the details of it, you indicated your concerns in the letter about the oh. FISA process. And I think uh, Director Mueller uh, put on the record the very clear way in which these FISA warrants are going to be processed in the future. 
and the question of intelligence also being added uh, in the warrant request. Um, my, my comment to you was, do you believe that, or my question of you is, do you believe that this is a substantial improvement now over the way things were? Uh, yes, and if you, in my written statement, too, I think September 11 <coughs> alone, just the, the acts uh, really ch created a huge change in mindset. And um, in addition to that, of course, uh, Director Mueller has announced that prevention will be our goal over prosecution. Prosecution, I think, should still be an important thing that we should keep in mind, but there are those instances, and when you have the two, pr prevention definitely has to, to override. I think that what he is um, stating that if there is a um, application that uh, someone at a lower level disputes or does not think should rise up, it will then automatically get reviewed at a higher level. By him. That's right correct. now by him. I'm, I'm not quite sure that maybe it could even be lower than him because I think he, he's a busy man and I don't know that uh, it would necessarily have to be the director. Although it depends, and that these would go then to the OPIR, right? As well, which, well, obviously would depend on his review. He may well agree with the uh, lower level, and that would be fine. It, we do need, though, um, as I said in my statement, we need a kind of a, a, a way to get around the roadblock. And I think with the FISA process, this is a pretty good idea to have it, or the ones that are not approved or disputed, to go to a higher level for review. Uh, obviously, the higher level may well agree that there it's insufficient, and uh, and that's fine. But at least it's had a good review. Right. And the second area that I asked about was really in direct um, reaction to your comments in your letter about what you call the super squad, which he has pointed out very carefully today was a flying squad, and that the local SAC would have. Uh, the authority to invent to initiate and the first inquiry. Um, the flying squad again with the kind of the difference that I see there is that with a with a small office that does not have translators, does not have enough forensic computer examiners, uh, perhaps does not even have enough surveillance experts that. If an office had that need uh, to have those um, additional resources, a flying squad could come and help out. It would really serve the purpose of flexibility. And if they, if it, if they didn't try to take over and micromanage something that may well already be at a certain point stage along, I think it is, is a very good idea. The only thing that I was really uh, worried about was the, was the fact that I saw this as managers coming to now take it over and micromanage or whatever. And i uh, that's the distinction. Thank you. Now, in your letter, you also mentioned, and I quote, a climate of fear which has chilled aggressive FBI law enforcement actions, decisions. And you attribute that to the fact that numerous high-ranking FBI officials who have made decisions or have taken an action, which in hindsight has turned out uh, to be mistaken or just turned out badly, have seen their careers plummet and end. That was a, you know, a very profound statement. I want you to respond to that, but I also want you to re respond to something else. And here's something which is enormously controversial and which has, no matter who you talk to, everybody has got a slightly different view of how racial profiling should or should not be applied. And exactly what it is, or whether it involves a country, whether it involves a race, whether it involves, uh, whether it has a chilling effect on FBI agents uh, instituting uh, this kind of inquiry. I would be interested in your observations if there are places where you believe you have actually seen racial profiling uh, impact or chill uh, an agent's perspicacity or desire to look into something. You want me to answer that one first? The racial answer, yeah. Um, I think one of the senators this morning uh, drew a distinction. Of course, racial profiling, I don't even like <laughs> the, the term or the word because I think it, it already has this pejorative sense and peop different people have different meanings in their own mind as to what it means. I agree with you. One of the senators this morning made a, a good, uh, I think it was a good, uh, line. 
when you use race, ethnic origin, religion, any one of those factors as a sole reason or the main reason to take an investigative action, that is what I would think of as racial profiling. So if a trooper goes out and stops all uh, uh, Indian males going down the street, that is racial profiling. Now, on the other hand, what you have are, we could get a report that a um, black male with a red baseball cap wearing white trousers and sneakers just robbed the bank. And you don't disregard the race, because it's just one of several factors that is describing that individual. So I think that's kind of what I see as the difference here between courts, I think, follow that rule. Do you think your colleagues have the same interpretation that you do? Because I think you have a very substantial interpretation. Um, well, the ones I train <laughs> uh, do. i trying to think if I've uh, brought this up in other law enforcement circles. I think in Minnesota, it's been a very hot topic. And uh, to the extent that it's been discussed, I've tried to point this out at different times that I think a lot of times you see people arguing when they're, they're not even hitting the issue because they have different definitions. And um, I think there, this, this, the, the, senator remark, this, the senator's remarks today kind of show that maybe this kind of thing is rising uh, where people are getting this better understanding of what is permissible, what is logical and common sense, and then what is improper. And, and, it's, uh, and you use the term, it's just a pejorative term, and then people like in the, the debate. I see the red light. Could you go to the first part of my question, which is the quote? Climate of fear. Yeah. Um, I think that, what, you know, as I said in my letter, that these high visibility um, demotions or uh, even uh, people being ending their careers have impact, and everyone sees this. There are times when um, it, that results in less than aggressive law enforcement. There are actually times, though, I think it actually is the opposite because. Um, your boss, for instance, could be making a mistake the other way. And let's say that your boss has said something that you think could be, I'm just using the example, now it comes close to racial profiling. Now if you're under that boss, you, with this climate of fear and whatever, you might actually be unwilling to challenge that. So I think it can actually work both ways. And I definitely think it results in less than aggressive law enforcement when we've had some high visibility mistakes. And in my paper, I, I drew a distinction between those mistakes that are really kind of deliberate or made for selfish reasons. And I think our people need to be f held fully accountable for those types of mistakes. Whereas the good faith type mistakes, I, I get involved in civil suits all the time, and we're humans, FBI agents are humans, we make mistakes all the time. Uh, in Minnesota once, we made a mistake and had the wrong guy arrested for a bank robbery because he was a complete look-alike of the real bank robber. And you know, that type of thing, we ought not to, um, you know, that agent really did nothing wrong. You know, everyone would make that mistake. So I think we have to distinguish between the types of mistakes and um, be careful about uh, pursuing the ones that really are good faith ones because I think we will have some, pro we will have some repercussions for that. Thanks, my time is up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Uh, Senator Grassley. I want to follow up on uh, what uh, uh, Senator Feinstein just uh, was talking about. I've been concerned for a long time about what I call <coughs> the FBI's culture of arrogance. Uh, in your letter, you mentioned a culture of fear, especially of fear taking action and the problem of careerism. Uh, could you talk about how this hurts investigations in the field? what the causes are, and what you think might fix these problems? Um, of course, I don't think this happened overnight. It's one of those things that starts to happen, and, uh, and eventually you get at a point where it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not good. And I think careerism, when I looked up the definition, I really said unbelievable how appropriate that is. I, I think that the FBI does have a problem with that. And if I remember right, it means promoting one's career over integrity. So when people make decisions, and it's basically so that I can get to the next level and not rock, either it's not rock the boat or do what a boss says without question. And, and either way that works, if you're making the decision to try to get to the next level, but you're not making that decision for the real right reasons, um, that's a problem. 
And I think that in the FBI, we've, we have had this, we've had some serious disincentives to getting into management. Uh, we've also had um, uh, some of our promotional system, I think, could be adjusted. There are some standards that we've, we've gone to kind of a, a real low level of legally defensible. Uh, it's become, over the years, a, kind of a volunteer system because a lot of good, good people that have good backgrounds uh, prefer not to transfer all those times. There's a lot of other reasons. So I think that the careerism is a problem. I think the, the, uh, the pecking order, which I alluded to earlier, uh, is sometimes a problem. And we have to be willing to, um, I guess as Director Mueller has done a little bit in this case with me, uh, when I made my critical remarks, I was quite worried um, because I don't, I know in the FBI, you don't venture close to criticizing a, su a superior a without really running some risk. But in this case, I actually was pleasantly surprised that, you know, I've been promised repeatedly no retaliation. And I want to hopefully hope that that kind of atmosphere now starts to kind of take over and that people make decisions. These are huge. Some of these decisions are just huge. You don't even know when you're doing it, but they are huge. And you've got to make them for the right reasons, not because I don't want to rock the boat, not because I don't want to bring up a problem to my supervisor, et cetera. Uh, I think it would be helpful to hear about uh, headquarters, FBI, from the perspective of your working in the field. Your letter to the director about the Masawi case talked about supervisors actually hindering that case. Now, I know that you can't talk about that case because of trial, and I appreciate they ate that and expect you uh, not to, but it would be useful for you to talk about how headquarters gets involved in cases from the field and what you and other agents think of headquarter involvement and whether the people there are helpful or a hindrance. Well, I, I mentioned in my letter, um, because I'm a, a legal counsel in the office, I interact a lot with our Office of General Counsel. And for the most part, the, the people in the Office of General Counsel that I um, interact with on a daily basis are very helpful. I think they, they mostly see their mission as assisting people, uh, giving advice, that type of thing. Our laboratory, I think, is, is something like that as well because their mission is to do that test so they can get it back to the field. Um, other entities are less helpful at headquarters because they do not see their mission as assisting in the investigation. When we get these uh, seven to nine approvement management levels in place at headquarters, many of those people see their job as kind of a gatekeeper function and kind of a power thing or whatever. And again, I think we have to stress that, you know, to the people, I, if we can limit the number of management levels, all the better. But the people, if they realize that their function is to um, assist in the way with intelligence in the future, hopefully this will happen if we have more analysts, that they see their function as assisting that investigation. And I think then, then it's helpful. So it's kind of a mixed bag, is, is I think what I'm saying. It's kind of a mixed bag, and some entities are helpful. Others maybe aren't quite as, uh, as what they should be. Well, could you kind of summarize that by saying, or let me summarize it and see if this might uh, fit it. You, headquarters ought to be helping people at the grassroots and not be a hindrance. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And then the worst is, I forgot to even mention, the worst is micromanaging. And there have been instances in the past where a higher level in the FBI has almost decided to tell an office how to do something. And I can name a few uh, cases where these just became disastrous. Uh, so micromanaging from a higher level is, is really the epitome of, of what would be the worst. I don't think you have to name those cases. We've looked into those an awful lot here in the last decade. Your letter uh, highlighted some of the problems within the bureaucracy at the uh, FBI headquarters with the many layers of approval in order to get a search warrant. What are your recommendations for streamlining this bureaucracy so that field agents can effectively pursue investigations? Um, well, I've mentioned before that uh, the bureaucracy is a huge problem and I'm, I'm really um, <laughs> I really have to think longer about, you know, how that would uh, be remedied. Um, I can mention one other thing about streamlining um, being able to uh, go around roadblocks. 
that might arise. And I've mentioned internally in the FBI if we're pursuing a FISA or an intelligence method. Um, it should also be recognized that uh, we pursue, we can pursue terrorism on a criminal level, and we can then go across the street to a, a U.S. Attorney's Office. And I think a similar mechanism perhaps needs to be considered also for U.S. Attorney's Offices. Uh, it's not a terribly different when you go and, and say, here's why I think I have probable cause to an assistant U.S. Attorney. In my write-up, um, in thinking about this, I thought it's kind of analogous to a person who gets diagnosed with cancer, and of course, uh, or with a serious illness, they always try to get a second opinion. Um, and it's accepted in the medical profession. But in the legal profession, uh, for some reason, it's not that well accepted that if you get an answer from an assistant U.S. attorney that you have a possibly have a way to have it reviewed again or have it reviewed by an expert in the field. And I, I think that we should maybe consider that for the Department of Justice to have some, I don't like really super squad, but maybe a cadre of, of also prosecutors that have experience with terrorism that in the event that we were trying to pursue it criminally, we might be able to uh, to uh, have a second a way around a roadblock that way. Okay, and my last, is my time up? Go ahead, go ahead. My last question is that we heard quite a bit about how the answers are somehow solutions to problems, but the FBI seem to be more compu computers, more money. Uh, not the first time that we've heard that uh, 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 supposed solution to problems at the FBI or, for that matter, a lot of other government agencies. How much uh, uh, do you believe more money and more computers will solve the problems with the FBI, or are there other more important changes that need to be made at the FBI? Uh, I think upgrading our computer system is uh, would be uh, nice. Uh, the ca capability to do these kind of searches and pull up um, related uh, information would be nice. I, I have in my statement today actually suggested a number of things that really don't require a lot of money. Upgrading our manual to give clear, concise uh, uh, guidance to agents working intelligence is not going to require huge sums of money. Um, the the uh, idea of, I have to look at some of the things, oh, some of the, the law, if we can possibly, towards the end, some of the uh, legal changes I've uh, uh, mentioned are could be problems. The uh, I'm going to. Uh, development of a, maybe a, a Department of Justice uh, cadre of professional expertise. A lot of, I, I have a few ideas that really don't cost, it seems that they really don't cost a lot of money. And I think that they should be considered in addition uh, you know, perhaps to upgrading the computers. We, the hiring of new agents always, of course, entails uh, money and funding, and I, uh, I'm not really in a position to comment whether we're adequately, adequately staffed. I, I think that we, the new measures to hire additional translators uh, is very good. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agent Raleigh, thank you for being here, and thank you for your service to our country. Um, your memo to Director Mueller said, um, quote, I don't find, I do find it odd that no inquiry whatsoever was launched of the relevant FBI HQ personnels and their actions, and despite FBI's leader's full knowledge of all the items mentioned herein, basically talking about the events of, of um, September. September 11th information that was on the Misawi case in the Phoenix memo. The SSA and his unit chief and others involved in headquarter personnel were allowed to stay in their positions and what's worse, occupy critical positions in the FBI's SIOC command center post-September 11th. Then you go on to say, um, I'm relatively certain that if it appeared that a lowly field office agent had committed such errors of judgment, the FBI's OPR would have notified to investigate the agent and would have at least quickly reassigned them. Now, I know you're not going to comment on that. Um, but you do, in your recommend your testimony today, talk about the management of intelligence, which I think is more or less what you were getting at in that uh, particular statement in your letter to the director, that perhaps there had been a uh, 
mismanagement of information analysis and processing. Uh, and in your recommendations, your recommendation number five, you say that uh, that management of information should be, uh, you, I'm paraphrasing what you improve, but specifically you say centralized information is required. However, it must be properly analy analyzed, evaluated, and disseminated in a timely fashion to the field. And uh, you also say recently that state and local officials, as well as the media, have frequently received more information than the FBI field divisions. So how do you uh, how do you think that we address that in the reorganization that's been proposed so far by the FBI? And I know you're talking about reducing the layers, but what is it specifically uh, that needs to be done to better process information at headquarters? Um, I th well, we've already discussed the computer. That would probably help somewhat, again, for an analyst to have the ability to go on the computer and then be able to put in flight airline or whatever it is and, and, and draw some intelligence together. So I think that probably would help. We need professional um, analysis of the intelligence we already have. I mean, we're, I think Director Mueller is talking about an intelligence, I'm not sure of the, the title, but it's something with intelligence. And the way I've perceive that is that basically this is a group of people who, who uh, conduct, uh, put together reports or conduct at request. If you have a, an issue or a question that they then can produce that intelligence that might add on to um, an affidavit or whatever, they may well entail requesting field offices to conduct certain investigations to be in a kind of a proactive mode that if they get two offices sending in something that looks like, oh my gosh, we ought to look into this, that we have a group who is in charge of analyzing and looking at these things so that we don't have two things coming in three weeks apart and not even being able to put it together. Is that somebody's specific responsibility today or several people? Uh, well, I think at the present time it's, uh, it's not done very well. I really don't. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, creating, as Director, Director Mueller is, is uh, starting to do that, I think that we don't have it now. And I think that this group hopefully would be there as function as an assisting thing to the, the offices that develop something or when they make a request. But, but when I look on this org chart of an Office of Intelligence, it doesn't, it doesn't strike me as a flat organization that you seem to be more describing. You're talking about information that's easily processed and driven back to the field. And to me, it's in, in, in no surprise, that's where most of America is moving in the corporate world to flat organizations because information flow is so critical. And it what? seems to me that you're describing a similar need that I'm not sure I... I, I haven't seen that chart. That's the first time when you held it up. And um, when I made my, uh, my first comments today and I mentioned that many of Director Mueller's ideas seem to be consistent with what my initial letter was, I did want, there is one kind of, I see maybe a slight uh, difference, and that is I really think we should scrutinize, exactly when you held it up, it just hit me, we really need to scrutinize all these proposals for this problem that creeps in of having these various levels. I, I think that the, the flat lining and if there's a way to, to reduce these levels somehow, we have to look at each thing and, and say, why create more? It's not going to be an answer. And that if I have one little slight difference, that's, that's, that was the impetus for my first letter. Really, it was. Well, I, I happen to agree with you that we're talking about more information flow here, and the thing that seems to be missing is the processing of that information and the quick distribution of that. And we're only going to get more um, given the um, type of uh, uh, attacks that we're monitoring. monitoring. Um, not to uh, catch you off guard, but I am curious tonight the President is going to be making a address about somewhat of a reorganization and uh, some of the uh, descriptions of it. We don't know what he's going to say yet, but some of it, m you know, his own press secretary of the department may be responsible for border security, intelligence, and other functions at several federal agencies that it now supervises. It wouldn't replace the FBI or CIA, but it might be one of the biggest restructurings that we've had. What advice would you give the president about this? Uh, <laughs> uh, we're, I really can't presume to give uh, advice at, um, I'm at such a high level. I will say one thing. 
Um, in the past, when we've had different agencies where there was some overlap in their jurisdiction, uh, the things that come to mind are FBI, DEA, because we shared drugs. Sometimes FBI and ATF, or where there was bombings that we kind of both got involved in. Um, if you have two different entities and there's an overlap and it's not clear who does what, uh, we can have some friction starting up and we can have some problems. So th that's the only thing that comes to mind is that it has to be kind of clearly demarked so that the agencies don't develop this friction and uh, we, we're not at cross, you know, cross ends with each other. So if, if there's a new agency starting, which it sounds like, um, that's the only advice I can think of. Well, I read in your statement that you didn't expect your memo to uh, create such a fear, but thank you for stepping into the spotlight and giving this issue the needed attention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very, very much, Senator. Uh, Senator Spector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Agent uh, Rowley, we thank you very much for coming forward. It is obvious that it was very difficult to write the letter, which you did, and uh, it is uh, uh, filled with uh, passion. You are really very concerned, a word you used repeatedly, and your purpose was of the highest, and there are obvious risks which you undertook in, in, in coming forward. Uh, I'm confident at this point that uh, the FBI and the Department of Justice will honor the commitments which they have made. And uh, if they don't, I know that this committee is prepared to make sure that they do. Uh, I think you performed a great service for the FBI because after uh, Director Mueller's first response, which was unresponsive to your memo, he did come forward and articulate uh, an acknowledgement of the problems and then move to correct them, which is indispensable. And we've said repeatedly that we're not interested in uh, uh, finding fault. We're interested in seeing to it that if there's a recurrence and you have all of these indicators that you put them together and you read uh, a roadmap which is there uh, on an analytical basis. Uh, I understand your uh, uh, limitations as to what you can testify to about a case. I spent uh, a dozen years as an assistant DA and as a district attorney and have some appreciation for what prosecution requires and what the limitations are. Uh, but in trying to understand the mentality of the FBI, which I think their general agreement has to be changed, I was uh, intrigued by your characterization that the United States Attorney's Office for a lot of reasons, including just to play it safe and regularly requiring much more than probable cause before proving affidavits, maybe if quantify 75 to 80 percent probability or sometimes even higher. Can you give us some insights as to why so that we might approach uh, the issue as to how we change uh, that uh, attitude? Well, in, in some ways, maybe that um, that could be misinterpreted. I think actually there are cases, um, playing it safe has kind of a negative connotation, but playing it careful or being careful or meticulous doesn't. And I think there actually are cases, uh, I think many times in uh, white collar cases, for instance, when you really are want to be extremely careful, uh, public corruption cases, these types of things where you really want to uh, be careful about proceeding, that it might well be appropriate to um, be maybe require something more than 51 percent. Well, I can see if it's a prosecution, perhaps, but if it's an investigation, it's very different. And I think the FBI has to change the approach to case preparation to investigation. But but even on the quantum of proof, uh, referring to uh, Illinois versus Gates, which I mentioned to Directive Mueller this morning, a 1983 Supreme Court decision, opinion by then Justice Rehnquist. He points out, going back to Locke versus United States in 1813, referring to the term probable cause, it imports circumstances which warrant suspicion. More recently, we said the quantum of proof appropriate in ordinary judicial proceedings are inapplicable. Finally, two standards, and then he refers to preponderance of the evidence useful in criminal trials, have no place in the magistrate's decision so that 
uh, Justice Rehnquist is pretty explicitly saying that it's not uh, a preponderance of the evidence. It's not more more likely than not uh, that it is. An, he quotes uh, Marshall, pretty good authorities, Chief Justice Marshall and Chief Justice Rehnquist, talking about about suspicion. So that uh, one of the things that we're going to be looking forward to, and I have discussed with the chairman the issue of pursuing this trail through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to, to, to find out. Let me go to another point which you raised in your uh, uh, exhaustive uh, letter. And that, that referred to the issue as to Zachariah Masui, and I'm not asking you about evidence now. We're still on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act issue, where you pointed out, quote, for example, at one point, the supervisory agent at FBI headquarters posited that the French information could be worthless because it only identified Zacharias Masui by name, and he, the special agent at headquarters, didn't know how many people by that name existed in France. Now, it's extraordinary. Zacharias Masui is not exactly a name like John Smith, and after you tracked it down, going to the Paris telephone book, you noted here that the special supervisory agent at FBI headquarters, quote, continued to find new reasons to stall. And here we're looking at what we have to do to have a sensible response from FBI headquarters on an application under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Can you give us any insights from your experience, which has been considerable Mm -hmm. considerably painful as to what we might do. Um, in my statement, I uh, talk about roadblocks, and uh, basically in, in that, in my statement, I'm addressing in criminal cases. When you first talked about probable cause, um, and we all know there's no perfect test for it, what I think has happened in years, we have um, adopted certain mindsets from uh, judicial rulings or from what might be the prevailing mindset in a U.S. Attorney's Office, and I think what we do see are elevated standards in some cases. And uh, one of my recommendations is that we have a sanity check, a second opinion, somebody else that we can maybe try to reason with. I really think it should be outside a particular U.S. Attorney's Office because um, what can happen uh, is that, you know, people are all kind of the careerism or whatever can be a problem there, too. In the FISA process, Director Mueller um, has uh, proposed same type of thing internally in the FBI. And I think his idea will, um, will definitely have results. Um, how many people, okay, if, if you don't approve it, and now it has to go up with, uh, um, with our, you know, kind of uh, attitude about having to take it up, how many times, if, I think it might actually the pendulum might actually might swing the other way too far. So I think that in the FISA process, the, uh, the proposal that we have now that it will be reviewed at a higher level if it's not uh, handled, I think that's, that's already there. Well, the review, my concluding comment would be that the review uh, is not really adequate unless you have uh, a standard which meets the legal requirement, but doesn't impose a burden, which is impossible. We changed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in the Patriots legislation to add the word significant to a significant purpose of the surveillance is to obtain foreign intelligence information. And after we investigated Wen Ho Lee, the subcommittee which I chaired, we came forward with a recommendation that when a high level officer of the FBI, like the director, took the issue to the attorney general. The attorney general had to give the reasons c coming back because the attorney general, Reno, personally uh, turned down the FISA warrant in, in the Wen Ho Lee case. But uh, uh, this, uh, this committee is going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to find out what's, what's going on. And uh, so far, we have only glimmers of information, like an agent Resnick was reassigned from a FISA unit apparently uh, removed by the special court uh, where the chief judge, Royce Lambert, uh, reportedly excluded him. 
And the question is, did that make that unit gun shy? The question is, did racial profiling make them gun shy? And in this kind of a situation, unlike ordinary cases where courts write opinions and we can tell what happened, uh, I've discussed with some of my colleagues uh, uh, the possibility of consulting with Chief Judge Royce Lampert about uh, uh, what, what went on, because we've got to figure out what is fair on civil rights, not overreact, but not look for 75 to 80 percent or even 51 percent. You go with Chief Justice Marshall on suspicion has to be quantified in accordance with the facts of the case, but I think that uh, your 13-page memorandum has uh, started us off on a, on a road which uh, uh, could produce a lot of fruitful uh, results when we really get down to brass tacks uh, and do it right and with an appropriate legal standard. Uh, the language change that's already occurred that you mentioned uh, has been uh, very beneficial. That was a, a big stumbling block, and that change already has produced some results. And I, as I talked to um, Senator Hatch, I think that maybe there could be some tinkering with the uh, aspect of having to prove, especially with terrorist groups, that this person is an agent of the foreign power uh, and kind of use that analogy that we can use other types of information rather than something that I, I use the example of a membership list, but you know, a photograph, uh, a telephone call, the same types of things that we might be able to use in a mafia case to put a RICO case together as an enterprise, that we can use that um, in a terrorism case to show that they're affiliated with or have connections to. But I think not, that would be a good idea. But not imposing a standard which is so high as to be unrealistic simply to protect somebody from uh, later blame for having made a mistake. That's if you I don't said, do anything, no mistakes. That's what Senator Schimmer was saying. Thank you, and I want to thank you again, Agent Rowley, as everyone else has, for your stepping forward and doing the nation a service. I read your memo. It was, you know, it showed you how long we have to go. There's a mindset there that has to be sort of cracked, and you, your memo does it in both a forthright but also a nice and respectful way. And I have a few questions. First, I, I don't know if you happen to hear the, uh, my conversation with uh, Director Mueller on the computer system. I, I heard some of it. I don't know if I heard the exact whole thing. Okay, but. well, the bottom line is that the FBI's computer system is amazingly backward. Uh, I've done a little more research on it, or I want to elaborate a little more. You can sometimes do a search by term, but you can never combine two terms. So you can use aviation and get a huge amount of stuff, and you can use school and get a huge amount of stuff, but you can't do aviation and school. You can That's correct. I actually, I kind of mentioned that earlier. It's absolutely right. And that just amazes me, because as I said to the uh, director, you can do that on my daughter's computer that she's in seventh grade that we bought her this fall for, I think it was, $1,400. And um, I know we've each year increased the amount of money. Tell me first, because I asked the director this, what led to what led to what led to the FBI being so backward and such a fundamental tool, in your opinion? I mean, this is not just typical. This is dramatically and deeply atypical, worse, <laughs> negatively atypical. Backward in computers. You have given me a question. I, um, of course, I have thought about some of these questions. I guess in my dreams or sleeping or whatever. But that's one I haven't thought about. Um, but just, I, you know, your knowledge of the yeah. bureaucracy, how could, assuming that most small businesses and even most junior high school students have better computers than the FBI, why would the mindset of the FBI be such that, as of today, this is? By the way, this isn't just as of a year ago. Um, he, Director Mueller said it would take two years at minimum to bring the system up to snuff. But one of the things that troubles me is... Why wasn't there somebody? I mean, this doesn't. This you don't need to be, get a PhD in computer science to know that to know that the problem, how deep this problem. You know that one of the only things that comes to mind, uh, and I have you know uh, 21 and a half years in, so I'm going back to when I was a brand new agent and I worked with the kind of like the people now who uh, would have been 20 some years ago, when this when we computers st first started coming on the scene, 
um, there, there was um, many of the old time agents can't type. Uh, they had, we had secretaries and stenos who, who actually wrote the interviews after you, you just dictated it and it got written. There, I do know there were a number of uh, people at higher levels back in the 80s who were kind of opposed to uh, computers and they hated them and the, and the typing and everything. Do they still have carbon paper over there at the FBI? <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, I think when I started, they, st they still had it. We had a lot of forms that were still on carbon paper that had to be hand typed. Uh, so I don't quite know why we've never... Um, I just, I'm real lucky that I was, I took personal typing in, in high school because that helps so much that when you can actually do your own, especially when you're going to write a letter that you don't have uh, anyone else to, that can see. I'm so <laughs> glad that I can type all right. And actually now, I should say that with our new agents, this really has, this is no longer an but issue. But this is, this is a function. I, you know, you can have a bunch of agents out there in the field who don't know how to type, but somebody at the headquarters should have said years ago that we, it's, it's such an yeah. obvious tool in crime fighting. Is yeah. it you? I mean. Of course, that's recognized now, and uh, I, I don't know exactly how this all developed, but it goes back some time, as you have noted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. I mean, I know the others have been watching this. We can watch these things on television from our offices. They broadcast them. Um, and I know a lot of people have asked you about the culture. But uh, let me ask you, what would you do if you were director, if the director came to you and said, how do you change the culture? I mean, this is a big, deep, proud organization that is now reeling, you know? It's, I'm sure it is. And there are many, many, as I'm sh has been said, many fine people, and they've done a good job on a whole lot of things. But it's been obvious to some of us that over the last several years, they've lost, not just in this area, but in other areas, sort of lost its edge. How do you change it? What would you recommend from your perspective as an agent in Minneapolis? Well, I think there's probably several things that could um, be done to improve um, the, the culture and the FBI uh, leadership and the problem of careerism. Uh, our Director Mueller has, um, I keep saying Director Mueller has done, said this and whatever, and in many cases this is true. Uh, he has mentioned time over that we need to pick our best leaders. We need to pick those best people out there. Uh, in my statement, I mentioned the fact that I've seen in the past few years just the opposite happening. I've seen a number of great uh, FBI agents with great background experience actually stepping down from their positions of leadership. It's actually gone the opposite direction, and, and for a lot of reasons. So somehow that has to be reversed. We have to give better incentives to getting into management. We have to reduce the disincentives. We Paperwork. No one's asked me about paperwork. Uh, I think that's a real problem. I think people. I asked you about the inverse computers. <laughs> yeah, I I think that you know we need to be judicious about that. Um, if someone, I go back to the don't rock the boat, don't ask the question problem. If I say why are we doing this? Does this really have any value? Does it serve a purpose? It's either one of two things. It's just like an, a complaint that we can all complain about it, but nothing can ever change. It just kind of falls on deaf ears, and no one, like, really examines it. Or, um, or it might actually be seen if you're criticizing some particular program write-up or so, some particular uh, uh, inspection thing. It actually might be seen as a challenge to somebody higher up, and they, say, they may get mad or whatever. So I think to, to some extent, if we're going to really scrutinize what is necessary and how we can become more effective, we definitely need to uh, encourage people to say, exactly, is there a purpose to what this is? And, you know, if there is, fine, we'll continue doing it. Can it be done quicker? Can it be done in a more minimal fashion? Those questions are not, uh, are not often, are not asked enough. It's, it's a real bureaucracy is what you're saying. <laughs> Um, to, uh, the day before I came here, I had to fill out our ethics audit, and uh, that meant that I had to name all the people in my office. Re essentially, I had to retype around 60-some names that I'm a good typer, but it, typist, but it still took me like an hour and a half. 
and I was busy as all get out, you know, three days ago, trying to do this and everything, but yet I had to take about an hour and a half to retype, and actually these names are in a file, and all you have to do is open up this file, and yet if I would have complained and said, why am I doing, I actually did complain, but um, I, still, I still ended up retyping those. Right. And that's just one little example. Right. Okay. We have a vote. There's only about two minutes left. That's what up. Oh, Patrick's back. I was going to call a brief recess, but I, I may come back and ask you a few more questions. But I'm just going to vote, and I thank you. And if I can't make it, I thank you double. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, we should bring you with us, and while we vote, uh, Agent Raleigh, we could probably continue. Uh, we could probably continue the question, just grab the uh, stenographer who's superb here, our, who's done this forever, and Paul Silver. You could turn the red light off. Uh, I don't think I'm going to take anybody's time. Um, one thing, and I was going to ask it earlier, but I didn't want to infringe on the time of the others. You said in your letter that there's a perception among rank and file agents that there's a double standard when it comes to discipline in the FBI. Uh, I remember hearing that way back in my days when I was a young prosecutor in Vermont and uh, working with the FBI then. What do you mean by this double standard? And if we could wave a magic wand, what would we do to get rid of it? <clears throat> the uh, let me maybe I can think of how we can get rid of it. Um, of course, you can just uh, we have in the FBI already in the last year or two when this problem has surfaced. It's been surfaced by others um, at various times, and and uh, there are examples I, I think uh, that have occurred in the past few years where higher level management uh, did the same uh, misconduct or made mistakes and. It, it, it was lightly dealt with or, or not dealt with at all, whereas uh, a lower level agent would be disciplined. And this has surfaced before. Now, in the last year or two, even prior to the director, there have been attempts just by um, policy to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, I think that they are already is in place with the SES system. Um, they've made some changes to that, so trying to, to uh, re you know, remedy the problem that they will have the same uh, I'm not sure, I don't know if it's, um, um, I know that the OIG in some cases now has been given some additional powers to look at things. It might require somebody just outside our agency because if you are in the chain of command, it's going to be very difficult to ignore that someone at a higher level. I, th I think it's kind of just inherent that, that maybe some double standard. There have been attempts though in the past year to try to remedy this. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Raleigh, I'm advised that some of the other senators on the Republican side are coming back on the vote. Am I correct? Make it. Yeah. And we'll, um, we'll stand in recess for a couple of minutes so they come back, give you a chance to stretch your legs and talk to your husband if you'd like. Thank you. We'll stand in recess for a couple of minutes. Again, uh, Senator Wine is here, and we can uh, 
Senator Wine, one of Chairman, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Agent Raleigh, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for your, your, your letter, your testimony. Uh, but most particularly, thank you for your uh, over 20 years of service to our country and to the FBI. I know that uh, you are one of thousands of dedicated FBI agents, and we just appreciate your <coughs> work. Um, <coughs> I talked this morning a little bit to the director, and I, I said that the, <coughs> your letter and your testimony, uh, but for the facts of this particular case, uh, probably could have been written by, by many agents, uh, that I sense a great deal of frustration uh, with agents, uh, those who have devoted their life to the FBI in regard to the bureaucracy that you've outlined in your in your letter. So I thank you for coming forward with the specific recommendations. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about those recommendations, but also try to get a better understanding of how your office works. Um, for example, uh, how many FISA cases would you have in a, in a year or possible FISA cases? I, I'm not quite sure, um, really, I'm not even qu quite sure I can answer that from a national security standpoint, other than to say our office would probably be one of the offices that ha would have far less than other offices uh, in, the, in the country. So relatively few is maybe the best I can say. You're, you're the legal counsel? Yes. I'm our, our um, legal counsel in our office. Uh, some offices have more than one, but uh, an office such as ours with about 115 agents or so, we uh, just have myself. Now, there's a similar thing, of course, in regular criminal cases for Title III intercepts, wiretaps. And uh, even in those cases, they can be different types of crimes. Um, they, we, we also, in those cases, would not conduct nearly the, n the number that other offices with uh, the mafia and bigger drug uh, cartels or whatever, but we do have a few of those uh, a year. Do, do you think, without getting into the specifics or the numbers or anything, do you think that that in any way impacted how this matter was handled? The fact that our office, um, actually, I'm not suggesting it does. I, I just don't know. Your office. No, I, on a, I don't want to comment specifically about this case, um, but I, I don't think really our agents in Minneapolis. Um, we have some top caliber agents. Uh, some of our agents have come from other intelligence. They have other intelligence backgrounds. And um, I really don't think it would have made a difference. Um, our, we really have top-notch people. But let me ask you, um, looking at this particular case, has it been your experience that uh, you've had other problems, not directly related to this case, or not using this case as, even as an example, but you talk about, you know, in your very lengthy letter, you talk about the bureaucracy, you talk about the frustration. Obviously, that just didn't, uh, that letter just didn't come up from, from this particular one case. I mean, you've had other problems. Correct. Correct. Um, and not only... So, would it be, excuse me, would it be fair to say this is, this is not unusual? But for circumstances unusual, national security matter is unusual, the horrible tragedy is unusual, but I, I've typical heard, in a sense. Yeah, I, and also, as you mentioned in your, at the start, that uh, this could be the complaint of uh, any number, large number of agents around the country. From the uh, responses I've received um, from field agents in other divisions, uh, up till now, and hopefully, you know, cross our fingers that it's going to start improving, that the, this has been the experience in many other types of cases. Uh, the bureaucracy has been a problem, hitting roadblocks internally and, uh, again, externally. It can be, um, in criminal cases as well, uh, is a problem. And uh, I think we need to think maybe somewhat creative ways of, of trying to uh, remediate this. Um, if I can, I don't want to take up all your time, but I didn't give a, a tremendous answer to uh, um, Senator Schumer earlier when he asked. We'll, we'll take that from his time, even though he's gone. <laughs> but he, he asked Chairman's about not laughing, so. 
it ties in a little bit with your question. So we'll give right. you 30% and him 50. All right. And, but I do have a couple more I'd like to get in. So. Uh, you know, when, the, when you're talking about the probable cause uh, and why this has kind of come into this issue, it's kind of complex where the mindsets start to change. And I know Director Mueller today mentioned something which uh, struck me as a little odd or a little, actually, I kind of bristled a little bit at it. He said, well, maybe someone suggested maybe we should give our agents training in probable cause. Well, first of all, that would fall to me. And I am, I am here to say that the agents who have 20 years in the FBI, who have done search warrants and Title III's and any number of things, really, really are quite, quite familiar with, with the standard of probable cause. Um, I don't think that uh, that would really serve any purpose to give some kind of okay. you know, esoteric training. All right. But there are some improvements, you know, to the uh, writing where, you know, the people on the scene uh, should be given some credit for their observations because those are first-hand observations. And they, in writing an affidavit, that should really be of, of primary importance. And there shouldn't be any rewriting of an affidavit further up the chain um, unless it's grammatical or really not of any substance. Uh, one of the recommendations you made, I would like to read to you, and then I'd like for you to comment on. Uh, number nine, development of confidential sources and assets. Just recently, in the wake of the Whitey Bulger scandal, the guidelines for development of confidential sources and assets have been extremely restrictive and burdensome. While some of the measures undertaken to monitor the informant process were necessary, were necessary they have now gone too far if not reviewed or trimmed, may result in reduced ability on the part of the FBI to obtain intelligence. you want to explain that a little bit? Um, I'm not the person in my office who's the informant coordinator, but um, we've all, of course, in the wake of this uh, new guidelines on informants, been given new um, additional paperwork that needs to be completed, additional um, items that need to be conducted before opening sources, before certain sources can do certain things. I think it should maybe be re-examined. I think I, I am one of the, I have to tell you where I'm coming from because back, uh, back in the 90s, we actually had an FBI agent who murdered his informant. And um, to me, it's, it's kind of like other scandals. It seems like we should have done something back then. And nothing occurred after that incident. Um, we did not have a policy in the FBI in the 90s that prohibited social or sexual relationships with informants. I, found, I find that just unbelievable because most law enforcement agencies had such a policy. I think if we would have had a strong policy, if we would have had some accountability and some good oversight, perhaps all of these additional things that later transpired wouldn't have occurred. And maybe now, when you, whenever these things happen, it's just inevitable that may, sometimes it goes a little too far. Okay. And we might have some additional paperwork that's... Right. Let me ask you one last question. In your letter, you mentioned the problem that agents have with the perception that sometimes they try for a Title III warrant, and then, then if that fails, go for a FISA warrant, which requires different proof but an easier standard. Uh, let me ask you this. Does that ha do you think that happens a lot? No, I don't. And are, I the, think are these suspicions reasonable? That no, I don't think it actually happens. In, in real life, uh, I do not, I've never seen where uh, you try for something to do it criminally, and if you fail, you pursue the intelligence method. I have never seen that. But do I think that there could, There's, there is a perception out there sometimes? I do think that there is a perception that this, this smell test or whatever exists. I don't think it's correct, but it, I think it does exist. Okay, good. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Agent Rowley, I had to leave to vote just as uh, Senator Schumer was beginning to ask you a question that I wanted to ask you, and it related to your answer to Senator Grassley's question about the computers. I just want to uh, maybe a quick response. You had testified in response to Senator Grassley that it would be nice uh, to have the new uh, computers. Um, I, I'm not sure you wanted to leave us with the impression, I mean, to me, nice is nice, but not really necessary, and I just wondered if that's really the impression you wanted to leave us with. <clears throat> if so, fine. I just want to give you a chance to respond. Well, to the ability to um, conduct research in, of our records, um, t as I described, where you're putting word, l just like you would on LexisNexis, for instance, where you're putting connectors and stuff, uh, 
I guess nice is not the word. When it comes to intelligence, and you really have these critical snippets out there, um, it's, it would be more than nice. I think it's necessary. It may not, in other cases, be all that uh, critical, but in, in intelligence, I think it is. Thank you very much. I, I assume that, uh, that most, most of us would agree with that. You had what I thought was a very uh, interesting recommendation in your statement, and uh, you haven't had an opportunity to discuss it yet. It's the public safety exception, the Quarles case, and I wondered if you would uh, uh, describe a little bit uh, why you think that would be important, and particularly in the context of terrorism that we're concerned about here. Um, thank you for giving me that opportunity. It's uh, a little issue that's uh, come up before. Actually, in criminal cases, we've had kidnappings. We've had uh, cases where someone's life can be right on the line. And we have a, there is a case that makes this really constitutional to, uh, I shouldn't say ignore Miranda, but disregard it in order to, for public safety reasons. The only problem with that case is it's the loaded gun in a grocery store. And when you start mentioning applying it to other cases, such as in a terrorism case, when we might want to interview someone, there may well be, uh, I always think of the bomb and someone ready to pu push it down. Uh, obviously, Miranda is a safeguard, and it's a, a good safeguard in many cases. But there can, it's like everything else, there may well be a time when it should be um, you know, overridden, and that would be to save a life. Um, as it stands now, there's a case about that, so it is constitutional. I think that it wouldn't be overturned if there was a, a statute about it. Uh, the only problem with a case is, like anything else, it's a case. In order to, to give timely advice to someone, you've got to run to a computer and, and pull it up, and I think that many people have kind of forgotten that case, and many courts have actually limited it to its facts. So I think that um, we have cases that come up from time to time. And do, you, do you think we should at least try to write some kind of a narrow uh, public safety exception? Um, I, mean, that, that, that I do. I, I, I contacted after September 11th. I called some staffers about this because I think it is an important issue, and I think it definitely has the potential to repeat itself. In other, it, it, it's not often. I shouldn't, you know, I know people will get alarmed if we say we're going to violate Miranda, but I don't think that it is it's something that comes up all the time. But there are these cases, um, the one I referred to in the, in the, it's the most dramatic one. There's a baby in a duffel bag in a forest that's been kidnapped that morning. And that is the type of thing, of course, that doesn't arise too often. But when it does, our agents really need to be somewhat, feel somewhat safe that they can, they, they can proceed. Right now, after Dickerson, after the Dickerson case, there's comment, there are commentators that are speculating that civil liability exists for the agent. So in addition to having the, the, the statement suppressed, which in a case like this, really, if it's saving a life, we would it goes back to your um, prevention versus prosecution. We wouldn't care about the prosecution. We wouldn't care about the, the, item, the statement being suppressed. We would want to save the life. Might even get sued. Right. Now, the agent might even get sued, possibly. Have, excuse me. Do you have to pay for your own uh, liability insurance or umbrella coverage or anything of that sort? It, it's my recollection that uh, we get $50 reimbursed from the Department of Justice for our uh, liability insurance. If I, I think that's right. I'm not sure. We get a portion of it. I think it's $50. But a, but a liability insurance policy that would protect agents uh, working in the course of their employment would cost a lot more than $50. Um couple hundred is it is it a, I think it's a couple around a couple hundred a year and um, that kind of civil liability protection um, you go back to your chilling factors even if agents don't even want to be sued it's like every you know any other right. person that the, the suit itself is a real uh, chilling factor of somebody aggressively trying to save a life We're, I, I'm I've been an advocate of, uh, of trying to have the, the government pay for the insurance for people who are working in the line of their, uh, their duty. Um, you uh, testified earlier that um, um, to something I thought was very important, and it maybe didn't quite receive the uh, um, degree of attention that I, I think is warranted, and it had to do with the new guidelines. From your experience as an agent on the line, um, and you said you had also gone back and reviewed uh, more historic documents in the course of your employment. Um, you view these new guidelines as very helpful to doing your, your job, and 
you, you indicated that you didn't think the American people had to be fearful that they would be uh, abused by the uh, by the agents, and you used the specific example of being able to go into a meeting, and if there were discussion of threats of terror, then that would be very useful. And if there weren't, then that was the end of it, is kind of the way you, you uh, uh, put it. Uh, would, do you want to amplify on that at all? Because I think this is a very important point for people to understand. Uh, I think that um, when uh, a certain guideline might be somewhat relaxed in this case, and of course Director Mueller has explained that uh, surfing the net is something any kid can do, uh, going into any meeting is anything a local law enforcement or anyone can do. I think that it's, it's the, the real um, crux of it is in how it's done. Uh, we also have the, the ability to collect information. So just by undertaking uh, to keep your ears open uh, and walk into that meeting, and then if something does transpire, you can act on it, that doesn't mean we get overboard and start recording things and, and mishandle that ability. It really goes into the, the, the capability to use it, but judiciously, because I think it increases only the potential for, uh, it does perhaps increase the potential of, uh, of going further than we have before. But it de I don't think it necessarily, I think we can have our cake and eat it too, is what I'm saying here. With I think good we training. Can, I think we can have, we can, with training, we can do these items and we still can avoid interfering with people's rights. I appreciate it very much, thank you. Senator Sessions, the location, man in Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think this has been a good hearing. I do, too. Uh, uh, we've had a good high-level discussion, some uh, uh, witnesses uh, talking about important matters. And uh, Agent Rowley, thank you for what uh, you have done. I know uh, it's an unusual thing, but it was an unusual circumstance. Before Director Mueller was um, confirmed, he and I talked. Uh, at his confirmation hearing, we talked, and I asked him questions, and they focused on the very things you raised in your memorandum. I just raised questions concerning uh, uh, matters such as uh, defensiveness on the part of the FBI, unwillingness to admit mistakes, some arrogance, uh, too much bureaucratic blocking, and particularly in Washington, that undermined uh, effectiveness of investigations in the field. and. I asked those questions based on my experience as 12 years as United States Attorney and two as an assistant. I believe that rec that is consistent with the overwhelming view of federal prosecutors throughout the system. And I believe, if you have noted, it's consistent with the views of the agents in the field. Uh, so to that extent, your letter uh, and the public hearing that's come about here, I believe will strengthen his hand and being able to uh, make the kind of cultural changes that need to be made. And, and I love the FBI. I know you do. And so we want to see it reach its highest and best potential, not hurt it in any way. I think, to my own personal view, that we hurt the IRS. I think that has been damaged by some of the things that were done. And we don't need to damage the FBI. We need to strengthen it and help it reach its fullest potential. But just back to this problem we were facing. It seems to me there's always a good excuse that the computer system wasn't up to date. Uh, if you had been given the point person to monitor the intelligence of, of the United States, wouldn't you create a system in which uh, important documents from the field would come to your desk personally within hours of the time they were sent forward? And isn't it uh, unwise or uh, inadvisable as, as apparently occurred with regard to the Arizona memorandum that some clerk sent it off to a different section and it never even got to the supervisor um, there? Isn't that a poor way to run a shop? Well, as a general matter, I'm not speaking to the uh, any particular case, but as a general matter, of course, it's obvious that um, we want the important items that need to be acted on to really get to the right place. Um, and if we do have a focal point at a central location, it's, it's very clear that they have to get that, in, get that information. There is a problem of, of when there's a lot of intelligence being gathered and the ability to distinguish the wheat from the chaff. And that isn't easy at, when you first get this information. So 
That is, I think, one of the reasons for having an intelligence analysis where we can really attempt to get these important things that need to be acted on uh, as a, a distinguished between something that's not so important. Yeah, well, I think Director Mueller's new organization will do that, and I don't think there's anybody there that's not going to be reading important documents from the field. Um, I think those documents could have been recognized as being important before September 11th. And, uh, had, um, and I don't think we can say with certainty, as you pointed out, that uh, they could not have helped us avoid uh, September 11th. Probably not, but possibly. Can I Go say ahead. one more yes. thing? Because I just thought of something. I, you know, the one way that of recognizing importance, um, really, and this can't be underestimated, the, the, the person who is experiencing firsthand the event. Um, okay, I'm just going to speak generally, but if it's a flight instructor or whatever it is, and this thing is real, um, I'm, that's not a good example, but I'm just saying that if it's a uh, somebody who has experienced it firsthand, many times is in the best position. It's not the person uh, f five levels up. And what often happens is it gets lost in the translation. Absolutely. The person I agree here with who sees it, feels it, eats it, really knows it's important. Someone further up the chain, and again, the message by that time has maybe been diminished or whatever, doesn't recognize the importance. All right, let me ask you this. Um, it's odd to me that the investigative agency, the uh, agency designed to protect public safety, and I've seen instances where this occurred in the Department of Justice and not just the FBI. Don't you think they shouldn't be uh, negative about things that might impact public safety, that they should be positive and help the uh, people in the field succeed rather than putting down and throwing up roadblocks? They ought to be helping them, recognizing that you were on to something important and uh, maybe uh, helping you legally or through intelligent searches around the country and world helping you to succeed. If you don't advocate, if the Department of Justice does not advocate and take it to court before a judge who has a final responsibility, who is going to make, uh, advocate it? Uh, well, that's, I, w I had forgotten to mention my point, I was, it was a footnote in my letter about the, the judges, and I think our system actually was originally designed to, to let a judge, it goes to uh, Senator Schumer's question too, all these perceptions of where probable cause may lie, our system really was designed to let a judge make those determinations, not someone, not, you know, other levels before you even get to a judge. Uh, when in doubt, if, and especially when public safety is on the line, I think we need to let judges look at these things and then uh, make their determination. I, I totally agree. In fact, I've heard from a prosecutor who, uh, you know, many prosecutors might be... Uh, uh, am antithetic to, you know, m you know, someone, it's even the second opinion idea. They may say, well, I don't want anybody second guessing me. But um, I've actually heard from a prosecutor about that point, about going, you know, when in doubt, when in doubt, take it to a judge. When lives are at stake. Especially. This is not a minor, was not a minor matter. This was a matter that dealt with l potential loss of life. And uh, I think you should advocate, not take the, now you've expressed an opinion in your letter that there was clearly probable cause at some point before September 11th. How confident are you of that? Uh, I'm not going to get into the, because of course these um, issues are before the other committee and I'm just mm -hmm. not going to comment at this time about it. Well, you say in your letter that um, probable cause existed in your opinion. That's correct. I actually still do stand not, by that. Or I didn't you, expect that letter. It's a close call. You know, that letter, actually the fact that everyone here is uh, aware of that, I didn't really know that would happen because I gave it to the Joint Intelligence Committee, and I, um, I think I have to be very circumspect at this point because there are ongoing proceedings. The, um, I might say uh, Senator Sessions, one of the things we, we made it very clear, Agent Raleigh has been extraordinarily forthcoming, as has uh, Director Mueller in his office. We did uh, agree that we would be careful limiting into issues that involve an ongoing, an ongoing case. I see. And this is I, one. See what you I would point out that some of the measure of raising.